Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give it a couple of minutes while our webinar fills in. In the meanwhile, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. So drop a note in the chat and say hi. Hey everyone, we'll get going in just a moment. Let us know where you're joining from today in the chat. All right, we'll get going. Welcome everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for uh, today's webinar. Um, today is World Product Day, a global celebration of product management, craft, and community. And we're thrilled to have all of you here with us. We're your hosts for today. Uh, this is Mark and Sai here with me, and I'm Marissa. I'm a senior staff product manager and product practice lead here at Onfido. And I'll hand over to my team members, Mark and Sai, to introduce themselves. Mark, why don't you kick us off? Hi everyone, I'm Mark Opland. I'm the VP of Product Design at Amfido, and I lead our product design and user research practices. Sai? Hey folks, I'm Sai. I'm a senior product manager here at Amfido, and I look after KYC, or Know Your Customer. Thanks both. Today we want to talk about how we can all build more customer-centric products. And we'll examine some case studies about what we've done at Onfido to bring a customer-centric approach into our daily work. For folks in the audience, if you have questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end of today's presentation. So let's dive into collaborative product development. Firstly, what is it? Well, for B2B products, this means bringing customers into every step of the product development process. And for B2B2C products, including the final consumer and research and testing. So why do we do this? Well, including customers in the product development process ensures we build products that solve critical business needs and creates bi-directional channels for feedback. The businesses who buy B2B products are the ones who experience the challenges that we're trying to solve for. So that feedback helps us build better, more useful products. And at Onfido, we see collaborative product development as the future of B2B services. Customers expect the business they buy from to be the experts, and by including them in our product processes, we can extend and deepen the partnership while innovating together. Before we get too far into today's content, let me kick off with a brief introduction about Amfido. Amfido's mission is to power open, secure, and digital interactions between businesses and their customers around the world. We do this by using identity verification technology, a combination of document and biometric checks, data verification, and fraud detection. Our mission is a joint one. We're connecting end users to business and vice versa. So helping our customers find success with our products is a huge priority. We work with our customers hand in hand to ensure our products are helping solve genuine pain points and key business challenges, including compliant user onboarding, new customer acquisition, and fraud for prevention. And there are several unique ways that we build quality products. PMs and designers work in cross-functional teams, including counterparts from engineering and applied science to concept and build products. Throughout the product lifecycle, our teams collaborate with folks from sales, product marketing, test automation, and analytics teams to ensure proper positioning, performance monitoring, optimization, and growth. And most importantly, we incorporate customers and end users every step of the way. In this webinar, we'll examine how we've employed multiple techniques to bring customers into the creation of motion, studio, and watch list. Building customer-centric products starts with a clear focus on who your customers are and what's important to them. At Onfido, our products serve both a B2B audience and a B2C audience 
which can be a challenge for our product teams. On the B2B side, our customers are focused on driving new customer signups, reducing customer acquisition costs, scaling while remaining compliant in all geos and preventing fraud. And our customers' customers are concerned with getting signed up for new services quickly and on the first try, and having access to inclusive products. And for our product teams, this means prioritizing accessibility and usability and ensuring our machine learning models are trained to prevent bias. By putting our customers and their customers at the center of our product lifecycle, we're able to ensure great business outcomes all around. And now handing over to Mark to hear more about how we work with customers and users. So why do we co-develop? You know, in the current era of consumer empowerment, the customer is at the heart of every business strategy and co-developing products with customers is crucial for a few key reasons. First, customers often have better understandings of their problems, needs, and desires than any market researcher. By co-developing products, companies can tap into these insights directly, leading to a more refined and appropriate product offering. Secondly, because co-developed products are built on this foundation of deep customer understanding, they meet customer needs in a unique and personalized way, and this will give your products a significant competitive advantage. Third, customers can offer fresh perspectives and ideas that internal product development teams and design teams may overlook, which fuels innovation. Every time we work with our clients, we learn something new, which takes us in directions we never would have explored otherwise. And finally, working with customers increases your chances of product market fit and thereby mitigates risks. The, closest your, the closer your partners are to your ideal customer profile, the higher the chance that your product will resonate with others like them. A common theme across this rationale is that customers give you greater insights, access to insights and data, which will serve as the fuel for great product development. So let's take a closer look at the relationship between customer insights and co-development. Now, this is a diagram that illustrates the structure of our user research practice at Amfido, but I think it works equally well as a model for how you can work with clients on co-development opportunities. Here at the highest level, at the top, you see exploratory um, work, and this is where you're working together to broadly explore the problem space. Here, you're establishing who your users are, what their needs and pain points are, and what their, where the greatest business opportunities and constraints may lie. Once you have a sense of where these opportunities are, you're then working at the second level, the strategic level, where you're working with your clients to develop a strategy for achieving desired results. And finally, the most common mode for co-development is tactical, and this is where we're actually building a product together. And here we wanna make sure our solution is usable and accessible and has a sound go-to-market plan. And we work with clients on their products and systems, and we also invite them to work with us on ours. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest benefits of co-development will be all of the things that you learn along the way. And so when you're developing your, old pro your own program, don't forget about the operational aspects of making customer and user insights widely available across your organization. We use tools like Product Board and Dovetail to share insights, but even Confluence and PowerPoint can be effective tools to share knowledge and tell stories. And so what does this look like when you put it all together? Well, Amfido Labs is an initiative we've introduced at Amfido that help our product and user research teams work more closely with our clients, both in gathering insights, but also in co-developing solutions. In the program, clients opt in to participate in user research workshops or to gain early access to alpha products. Now, Labs was created to solve a very, very difficult problem for us. As user researchers, designers, and PMs, it was really hard to work with our clients, and there were a few reasons for that. And the first, and probably the biggest reason, is we have a lot of questions. At any given time, we might have 10 or more product teams actively seeking insights and feedback from customers. And if each of them wanna have conversations with five to seven clients per quarter, you can see how this quickly escalates into quite a noisy environment for our client. Second, there are a host of other communication touch points to be accounted for. Our clients also receive outbound marketing emails, invitation to knowledge sharing events, updates from legal and compliance, and a whole other set of outbound communications. And we needed to be more deliberate and methodical about how we reach out to clients to kick off these relationships. And finally, in our org, and this is probably similar in your orgs as well, is that product doesn't own the client relationship. Our customer success managers facilitate our relationships with clients and have so much more context about what is going on day to day. Depending on what their focus is at any given time, 
whether they're trying to close a deal or work with a client to resolve a sticky problem, the time wasn't always right for us to just reach out and have a code development or user research conversation. And so these things made it quite difficult to find clients quickly, and time is always of the essence in product. So what Labs has enabled us to be much more measured and coordinated about how we approach our clients with these opportunities. But it's also fostered valuable connections between the product team and other teams at Amfido who lead complementary programs, such as our MPS survey, our customer onboarding and support team, professional services, and our customer advisory board. So let's dig even deeper into what code development looks like. Now, code development doesn't look all that different from your typical iter product development lifecycle. It typically starts with a hypothesis or a question that we have, which we then take and we develop a means to test that hypothesis. And typically for us, that'll be a prototype. It could be a survey or a number of other means to test. We then follow, execute that test, either live or in a lab setting. And then finally, we synthesize the learnings which only creates more questions and informs the next iteration. And the faster and tighter these cycles, the more effective the process is. But rather than talking about a diagram, we would love to share three use case studies that illustrate how collaborative product development works in practice. And within each of these case studies, you'll see a theme emerge around quick iteration and continuous discovery. And for um, our three use cases, we adopted a process where we generate hypotheses as a team, we designed and prototype solutions, we tested our assumptions, and then we synthesized these findings into insights. So before we dive into our case studies, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the first two products we'll be sharing. First up is Motion. Now Motion allows our customers to verify their end users are genuine with a quick and simple head turn movement. And while that seems straightforward enough to deliver, in practice, the team embarked on a process of iterative sprints and close collaboration between design, engineering, users, and clients to deliver this best in class for accessibility and anti-bias. Julia is going to join us to share how we built motion, putting how we built motion and put our customers and their end users at the heart of our research and development process. Right after that, Steve will share on Fido Studio. And Ofito Studio is a visual tool for building identity verification and onboarding workflows without the need for constant development resources or app releases. Our customers use the Studio Editor to create these workflows with each step of the flow represented as a task on an infinite canvas. And these tasks are connected together in a style similar to a flowchart with conditions and branching paths and outcomes that can either be automated or escalated to people. So Steve will share how the studio team use these principles of quick iteration and continuous discovery to get this product to market. So let's jump into these case studies. Motion is our next generation of facial biometrics product that provides the perfect blend of security and user experience. Before showing you how we built Motion, we want to start by telling you why we decided to build it in the first place. The idea of Motion was born to solve business problems for our customers, in particular around low automation and user drop-off with our existing video product, as well as new fraud vectors emerging daily. On the one hand, we knew from customer feedback that our user experience, particularly in our existing video product, caused negative friction and was not very intuitive for end users. But we also knew that customers love this product due to the active liveness and fraud protections. We also knew that fraudsters are becoming more sophisticated and harder to stop, and that there are emerging trends that we were going to miss in the future if we didn't do anything about it, like deep fakes. Therefore, we wanted to build a new product that would maximize fraud protection to our customers with a simple, seamless, and inclusive user experience that could be used by anyone. So the idea for Motion was born. The secret to building such a great product is in the amazing team that worked on it and on the unique cross-functional collaboration across multiple disciplines. It all started with a heavy investment in the user experience, where we iterated over more than 50 prototypes that were tested with over 100 people before settling on the final design. We explored things like different head position challenges, for example, by getting the user to turn their head versus moving their device, or different ways to provide instant feedback in the UI. The engineering, UX research, design, and applied science functions worked hand in hand, learning and iterating together in order to find the best balance between great user experience and strong biometric signals. The final design of Motion provides a best-in-class user experience because it is designed for humans, not machines. 
The face alignment and head turn steps were refined to be comfortable and forgiving. And on top of that, live feedback and an intuitive completion pattern help users to maximize their chance of succeeding. Because we want our products to be inclusive, we have invested efforts in accessibility and trained our models to reduce bias. First, let's look at what we've designed to make motion accessible, which we verified with an audit with the Digital Accessibility Center. For colorblind people, but also to improve the user experience of all users, we made sure that all changes of stakes were clearly noticeable with great contrast. For users with bad eyesight, we made sure that they could increase the text size in their phone settings while keeping a good UX. For visually impaired users, we've designed a screen reader experience to make sure they have all the context and feedback needed to capture their faces. Now, inclusivity and fairness have been at the heart of the work we did on the machine learning technology that powers motion as well. Our goal at Unfeed is to create AI ethically because we're a global company and we serve customers in every corner of the world. So it's important to us that we ensure that our products work equally well for everyone, regardless of gender, age, or ethnicity. So bias mitigation is core to our product mission and it is something that we've proudly embedded into every step of the motion research and development processes by training our models on diverse and global data sets of spoofs and joining users. Finally, we wanted to make sure that once motion was ready, it could be easily tested by our customers to ensure that they could see the same results that we were seeing in our research environment. To do so, we built an A-B testing framework that would allow us to progressively redirect the percentage of our customers' traffic to motion so that they could test it in a flexible, safe, and controlled way. This customer-centric approach allowed us to easily find early adopters from the alpha stage and work together with them to keep improving motion until it was ready for general availability. So this is a story of motion and how we've built it by putting our customers and their end users at the heart of our design, research, and development processes. Hi, I'm Steve Dennis, a product design lead at Onfido. I was part of a small product team that bought Onfido Studio from concept to launch in 12 months. Customers were involved throughout that time with early test customers getting value from the product within the first six months. We had two unofficial guiding principles for this product that helped keep us focused on the customer. The first principle was quick iteration. We untethered ourselves from much of the existing tech and process debt we'd experienced in other teams and tried to build as lean as possible in a fresh code base and with as little process and distraction as necessary. This allowed us to get working demos in front of potential customers quickly and reduce the time required to learn. The second principle was continuous discovery. While we started designing and building from day one, we also had dedicated user researchers conducting discovery, validation, and usability testing throughout the entire length of development. We collected all research artifacts and customer insights across two key systems, Dovetail and Product Board. We use Dovetail to store recordings of interviews, generate and edit transcripts, and synthesize research into stories and insights. We collect customer feedback and feature requests from our growth team and Product Board. Product Board gives us a good sense of the problems customers are having, and Dovetail lets us go deep on these problems and get to the why. We've slowly built an internal culture around these systems, and you'll frequently see people in Slack reminding and redirecting people to add customer requests and feedback to Product Board so that we have everything in one place. A good example of these principles in practice was our flow analysis feature. We'd previously done a project with customers to identify their pain points and opportunities. The journey maps we produced from these conversations showed a common need for funnel and drop-off analysis of their onboarding flows to help them identify areas for improvement and track the effectiveness of potential solutions. While this need was universal, the solutions were not and were often custom-built internal analytics tools that were difficult and costly to maintain. We conducted a round of interviews focused on performance analytics and identified some core areas where we could add value. Because our flows were already built visually and structured like a flowchart, it seemed likely that overlaying funnel data in a similar visual way would be easy for customers to understand. We shipped a quick and dirty version in a couple of weeks with the sole purpose of learning more about the solution. We found customers were able to understand the data, but additional data points were quickly identified as needs, and these were things that wouldn't have surfaced without this early version to prompt those conversations. We've continued iterating on this feature and are in the process of adding in a lot more detail for each task, as well as visualizing the retry paths users take within the flow, both of which we're excited to be launching this quarter. As a result of these principles, our discussions and conversations internally have become a lot more about 
which aspects of user value we should be prioritizing rather than theoretical discussions about potential user value. If your team has maybe struggled to adopt practices like quick iteration and continuous discovery of the past, my recommendation would be start small and approach it as an experiment. What might start as an eight week trial with one small team talking to customers every week could be a success story that results in longer term process shifts for your product, design, and engineering orgs in the future. Thanks. Well, we had so much fun building those products. Um, but up next is Sai, uh, who will talk to us about another product we had a lot of fun building, our watch list product. Sai, take it away. Thanks, Mark. Hello again, folks. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit now about some development that we did in very close collaboration with our clients on a product called Watchlist. Watchlist screening is a global regulatory requirement for KYC, Know Your Customer, and AML, anti-money laundering. At the point of onboarding and beyond, regulated businesses in the financial services vertical have to be confident that their end users aren't sanctioned, politically exposed, associated with certain types of crime, or on any other naughty steps like the FBI most wanted list. So they, or in fact we, have to screen thousands of sources to give them that confidence and armed with very little end user data, usually just a name, a date of birth, and a country of residence. And that is not a lot to go on. All of this presents a very costly human problem. Our clients employ big teams of ops folk whose painful job it is to look through lists of baddies who may or may not be their end user and decide whether or not to onboard them. To make life harder, they're almost always using multiple systems to complete this process. On Fido's dashboard, their own back office, and uh, sometimes even another provider in the mix. These ops analysts, and ultimately the business as a whole, have a primary pain point which is inherent in all watch list screening products, false positives. A false positive is a match who shares some attributes with their end user, like a first and a last name, but isn't their end user. And being able to tell the difference between these false positives and actual matches quickly and confidently can have an enormous impact on a company's onboarding rate. And as I mentioned just now, these analysts don't have many attributes to go on. At most, a full name, a country of residence, and a date of birth. So let's have a look at how we partnered with our clients to help them with this problem. I'll start by showing you where we were with our watch this product a few months back, when it was very much more uh, of an MVP, a state that we still think is critical for fast feedback and high quality insights from clients. And keep in mind everything I just said about what those ops folks are trying to achieve quickly and accurately. Here's the Onfido dashboard, and you can see that this client has been running checks on their end users. So let's just take a look at one of those end users. Okay, so the client has run a watch list check on this user, and if we expand the check, we can see a bunch of stuff. At the top here, we have the overall report result, and then below we have what we refer to as breakdowns, the results of which contribute to that overall result. So far, so good. But after that, things start to get a bit tricky. The analyst gets a list of matches all on one page. You can see the top one here. And there's a bunch of data here about the match, but it's not really clear what it all means. And what was the name of our end user again? And when were they born? And where do they live? There's a lot going on here. And maybe this is a match that needs investigating, but it's very hard to tell at a glance. Ops teams are trying to identify those matches and false positives quickly and easily. And this UI isn't fully solving the problem yet. So we figured, right, we've got to solve this problem. And to solve it effectively, we've got to do it hand in hand with our clients. And so we defined some super simple criteria to go recruit candidate clients to partner with us on a discovery project. First off, they should be actively feeling the pain points I talked about right now. It's no good us asking happy clients, hey, what would you like us to tweak for you guys? It's got to be, hey, we know you're hurting and we want to fix this together. Secondly, they should be mid-market clients, the folks most likely to be using the Onfido dashboard to review results, not the bigger enterprise clients who are more likely to just consume everything via API and pump it into their own complex back office systems. 
And finally, they should represent a range of subverticals within financial services, because different subverticals like crypto, trading platforms, and fintech challenger banks all have differing risk appetites and processes. And our job is to spot patterns and build what's generalizable. So we went out to our client contacts and our growth org, and we brought in a bunch of clients that fit the bill. Next, we started interviewing. And for this project, the personas we're speaking to tend to be a mix of product, compliance, and ops folks who all touch this stuff at different points. Product people need to be confident that they can integrate, uh, integrate us into their own systems and processes. Compliance people need to know that we're gonna keep them on the right side of the regulator. And the ops people I mentioned before are usually our watch list UI users on the ground floor. So we use a detailed discussion guide for each interview to make sure we get what we need by asking them the right open questions. Ultimately, the high level goals here are to get a deep understanding of our clients end to end manual review process, both inside and, and outside of our product, to validate our existing hypotheses and assumptions, to understand to what extent we've already solved the problem and alleviated pain points, and to discover new problems that need solving that we haven't even considered yet. And so these interviews are the first pass towards those goals. In the next step, we go deeper again. Now we're going to shadow the ops teams as they undertake the manual review process. And this is where the richest insights are coming from. Seeing the pain points firsthand is infinitely more valuable than just hearing about them. When a client or a user tells us what they want, or better yet, what they need, it's definitely useful, but it's coming through a lens. There's inevitable bias in there, and it doesn't let us into the root of the problem. When someone shows us what they do, day in, day out, that's when the light bulb goes on. We can really empathize, and we get that deep understanding of the job to be done. And while we're listening and watching, we're trying to be disciplined in being super objective. We're taking reams of notes, but they're either direct observations or quotes. They're not opinions or inferences or solutions. So we do this a bunch of times with different clients from those targeted criteria I mentioned before. And then we take away what we've learned and we synthesize all this rich information with a tooth comb uh, in dovetail, as Mark mentioned earlier, uh, into overarching themes and more granular categories. And then it's time to design. On this project, we got designs in front of our discovery cohort before we went any further. Now, it's important to stress that this stage isn't about sign-off or approval, we're not an agency. It's about getting a sense as early as possible in the process of the degree to which we're going to move the needle for our clients with these enhancements. And finally, we enter the build, measure, learn cycle that we all know and love, iterating rapidly with a weekly release cadence, then shadowing again to get that rich qualitative data in, synthesizing our learnings and repeating the cycle. So let's re remind ourselves what MVP looked like. Okay, and now I want to show you where we are with our watch list UI now, after all of that collaboration. And remember that the overarching job to be done here is identifying those matches and false positives. All right, so here's our watch list check again. Overall results and breakdowns remain the same because ultimately the same logic applies here. Any matches still need to roll up to trigger a consider result so the client knows this needs reviewing. The enhancements which are designed to reduce that operational burden are below. At this level, we're now exposing a bunch more data. You can see the match name, match type, date of birth, and country of residence, all data points that we know from our clients are key to helping ops analysts identify false positives at a glance. And we're displaying the end user data right above the match data for quick comparison. No more navigating to another page for that, the painful journey that we observed during shadowing. Analysts can also now filter by match type so that they can cut out the noise and just review the category that's highest priority to them right now. And if we expand the match for more information, you can see the end user data is displayed at match level as well, because we never want to force analysts to go backwards to compare data. Below, there's now a photo of our end user alongside a photo of the apparent match. And it doesn't look like this is our end user. Scrolling further, and there's a whole lot more information than we were returning before, but it's now restructured much more clearly into sections to help analysts review according to match category. And down here, 
you can see we're also now expanding adverse media URLs and including lead text to make it that bit faster to check if an article is about this user. Finally, matches are now ranked by a scoring system according to the factors that we now know matter most to our clients. Now, we're by no means done. Discovery and delivery is a never ending process. We know there's plenty more to do on tooling to ensure Onfido can be that one stop shop for watch this manual review. But we didn't want to wait for full case management to start alleviating some of our clients' operational burden. Working this closely with clients means we need to release rapid and incremental improvements. All right, back to you, Marissa. Thanks, Sai. So why are we taking this collaborative approach here at Onfido? Well, it's well proven that diverse teams build better, more innovative products. And by bringing in collaborators from across Onfido and from our customers' teams, we increase our likelihood of launching and scaling top quality products. And in turn, our customers are also more likely to find success. Plus, our inclusive product development processes help deepen the two-way relationship with our customers creating new opportunities where both parties can share expertise and creativity. So what can other businesses learn from this? Well, start by focusing on your power users. These are the ones who really want to try new products early and who will also shout about you to their peers. These customers will want to spend time with your product teams and they're more willing to share feedback openly. And of course, you want to start with the problem. Being specific on customer needs and challenges will help you find product market fit and then scale your product. And lastly, you want to look for patterns. It can be really tempting to follow the feedback of one or two customers, but you'll end up with much better results if you incorporate multiple voices and opinions, especially as your customer base grows. If you're keen to learn more about customer-centric methods for building products, check out these all-star books and podcasts. And no product webinar would be complete without a shout out for Marty Kagan's Inspired. We're also big fans of Jason Knight's podcast, One Night in Product, and Continuous Discovery Habits by Teresa Torres. And across the bottom, we have Mind the Product's podcast, The Product Experience, Lenny Roshitsky's podcast, and The Lean Product Playbook by Dan Olson. Thanks very much for joining us today. And now we'll take questions from today's attendees. So the first question we have up, uh, and Mark and Sai, feel free to jump in uh, with answers. As a B2B company, is it hard to get access to customers? And how did, how did you get access to the right people for research or development? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I think getting direct access to customers was one of the stickiest problems our user research team has and, and was the impetus for creating that labs program I spoke about. Um, it continues to be a challenge again because we, we're always mindful of asking for our clients' time um, and, and for asking them. But what we found is, is we have really fabulous clients who want and have a vested interest in working with us um, to build better products, right? So we have these sort of shared outcomes that we're looking to drive. And we find that more clients are really willing and eager to learn from us as we are to learn from them. And so we found that the program has helped us make uh, these connections. So, uh, you know, starting to build a program around it and having that two-way conversation and especially inviting customers and clients to opt in has been really helpful. I think that small move of enabling them to opt in has already uh, given us a signal that they want to be engaged with us. Um, and we found really, uh, really sort of positive and mutually beneficial relationships as a result. Great. Um, thanks for that context, Mark. We have a second question uh, up from the audience. So what do you do when co-development customers have competing asks? And maybe I'll pass this one to Sai since he's been working really closely uh, on the watchlist co-development. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a great it's a great question. Um, when when clients have competing asks, so I think so in product, you know, we talk about the the five whys. And um, so a client asks for something and you ask, why do you need that thing? And they give you a reason, and then you ask why again, and you drill down deeper and deeper and deeper into the problem. And 
in my experience, um, certainly recently, and you know, working in this um, kind of tightly regulated space, um, it often transpires if you are, you know, if the, if the clients that you're talking to have similar profiles, because ultimately we're trying to build products with and sell to, to, to kind of similar profiles of clients, then when you drill down into the root of those competing asks, often it turns out that the problem at the, at, at the heart of it, at, at the root, is actually something that you can solve for both of them and those asks don't have to compete. Um, and so an example uh, might be, so a client might say, we need you to extract this data point from a document and we say, why? And they say, because we need to pump it into our back office. And we say, why? And so because compliance needs it, why? Oh, because the fraud team told them that this is a useful data point to help us guard against fraud. And that's when we get that deep, then, then the, the light goes on and, the turn, and we think, okay, well, actually, we know that that data point is not gonna be useful to help you guard against fraud. So here are other ways that we want to solve that problem for you. And then it turns out that actually these asks weren't competing. Um, so yeah, I think it's a long-winded way of saying drill deeper into the problem and what's behind it, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. The only thing I'll, I'll add on top of what uh, Sai has said is that um, I think it can be really helpful to be really clear on who your target audience or audiences are up the top of this process and understanding sort of what priority order you want to sort of build for uh, each, each different group. So if you do end up in a case where there are competing asks that have, you know, uh, competing needs and uh, maybe seem like they don't go together, even after the five whys, like size explained, by going back to that original priority list of your target audience can help you say, okay, actually, we understand that these kind of don't go together. We need to choose one first and the other one second, but this audience is actually more priority for us than this audience, so we'll make a decision in this way. Um, and so if you do end up in that circumstance, going back to some of your original decision-making can be really helpful. Cool, these are great questions. So one more, in working with customers, what teams are pivotal to include to fully understand the goals of customers? That's a great one. And Mark, you definitely look like you want to jump in. And so maybe, maybe I'll chime in. I think when I think about um, the best collaborations we've had with internal teams, I would probably say start by prioritizing the teams that are talking, having direct conversations with clients the most. Right. So there's a number of folks at Amfido that are having direct conversations with clients. We have the sales team, we have support engineers, product and engineering, we have user research. And in each of those contexts and each of those conversations, you'll get a slightly different perspective on what the customer's needs and priorities are. And what that can help us do, right? When we're having product conversations, we're obviously and, and having it in a relatively narrow context. What this will enable us to do is to broaden that context and to, I think, mirror back the, the previous question that was asked is how do you prevent developing for one client or competing client demands? It helps us ensure that the solutions that we're building when co-developing are gonna work for our broadest customer base, are gonna be things that the sales team can go out and sell and build a, a go-to-market strategy about. They're gonna be things that our marketing team can position and make sense in our product portfolio. And they're gonna be things that our support team are gonna look at and be like, this is gonna be really hard to maintain. Um, it's gonna be hard to pull data on. It's gonna be hard to analyze, right? So I would say um, in terms of your internal teams, anyone that has conversations with clients, and then don't forget about some of the teams that you forget to talk about until really late in the process. So reach out to your legal and compliance teams. Make sure you let them know what you're building because the last thing you want um, is to get a little bit of late breaking news that, that has a tendency to put a spanner in the works. But th those are the folks that we work with um, the most. Marissa and Sai, anything um, you want to add to build on that? Uh, no, I think that it's spot on. I mean, just going as broad as you can internally, um, because I mean, I sort of speak slightly to what I was saying earlier, but the, the more kind of data points we get internally um, from those folks who are that close to clients, the faster we can spot patterns and build what's generalizable uh, across the board for the for the most clients. Yeah, that's great. I mean, Mark, I love the shout for our, our legal 
uh, our legal colleagues because they they for sure definitely get looped in way too late in the process uh, so often. I think uh, for me uh, in working with some of our internal teams, I love grabbing folks from our solution engineering or imp implementation teams because they're working hand in hand with the engineers who are sort of doing the integrations and they have the the most detailed view on sort of what the customer is building, why, how it fits in with, with other elements of their end-to-end -end process. So usually, at least for me, besides, of course, keeping our legal, our legal friends top of mind, uh, those are usually the, the groups that I go to first. You up for one last question? All right, so how do you find the right balance between discovery with some customers and delivery to all customers? Oh, that's a great question. Sai, I would love for you to take this one. Uh, yeah, so I think it it's kind of coming back to what I was talking to uh, earlier in that in that recruitment phase of discovery, when you're going out to your you know existing client contacts and to the to the sales org and to the solutions engineers to build a you know a discovery cohort of of clients, and so at that stage, I think it's super important that your cohort is is representative of the you know the the wider customer profile that you that you're trying to, to sell to and so um you know when we were doing that work uh, on watch list we said okay well our you know our core market is financial services but that's actually quite broad and so we you know you could fall into the trap of, of only speaking to banks say but of course the banks compliance teams are probably the most risk averse and so you're going to get a very specific set of insights and if you only build for them then actually that's not going to you know it's going to be harder to sell to um you know crypto exchanges or, or whatever and so when we're when we're recruiting a cohort we want to try and get make sure that there's a range of sub verticals um, within that that that, uh, that that financial services vertical, or within whatever you know customer profile it is that you're trying to build for, um, so that it's as representative as possible, and then finding the common themes across those sub verticals. I think that's that's kind of critical. Yeah, great tips, Mark. I would love to get the perspective from like the design design org. Boy, how do we build the right balance between discovery with some? So here at Amfido, um, you know, in the identity space, we have typically two types of customers. We have some clients who are highly sensitive to fraud, uh, and we have other clients that really want to optimize for conversion and are willing to take slightly more risk. And we're constantly trying to seek this balance between fraud mitigation and the friction that that adds to the user flow, to the end user's flow, and conversion, right, is reducing as much friction as possible to convert as many clients as, as possible. And I think that balance, um, it's never an answer that, that comes easily, right? So uh, that's this is where this co-development and this iteration cycle is really, really important. So we are constantly testing our different approaches and Motion was a really great example of this. We were trying to find that perfect balance between a product that stops fraud, that is highly sensitive towards spoofs and fakes, um, that can identify live people with the lowest friction. And I think what we're trying to find is that magic point between the two um, that delivers value in both places. So that balance is about finding that balance point. It's about, um, you know, what we're not trying to find is a compromise. What we're trying to find is a solution that really drives outcomes for the largest number of our clients. And, and sometimes it is about compromise. So sometimes the solution isn't neatly packaged and it, it's not always a perfect solution. And other times we make the hard decision to optimize for one set of clients, sometimes at the cost of others. Um, but it is always a, a really interesting debate and a really interesting conversation with our clients who appreciate that openness and honesty. They understand that we, as, as a SaaS business, um, you know, are, are trying to meet a, a wide number of needs and appreciate, I think, the transparency and honesty when we're able to say, hey, you know, we're, we're not able to do this and, and maybe there are other ways to reach that outcome. Yeah, I completely agree. I just want to add uh, a shout for Jeff Patton, um, who has a, di a very well-known diagram of what he called dual track agile at the time. And regardless of, you know, how your teams are actually working together, I think that that diagram, you know, says it all. Ultimately, what you have is sort of two paths of circles that are sort of 
rolling together at slightly different sizes and speeds and paces. And for me, anytime uh, someone asks me about the balance or juggling, uh, you know, priorities between discovery and delivery, that diagram is always the first thing that, that pops into my mind. I do think that it's messy. And I think that we should be honest and open about how messy it is. It's really difficult, you know, with one team and, you know, finite number of hours in the day to be able to do all the things that you want to do as a product person. Um, so yeah, shout out to Jeff Patton's uh, diagram and as well, uh, one more shout out for Teresa Torres's book, uh, which we showed on the previous slide because she's also, you know, the leading expert on these topics right now. So unfortunately, uh, that's it for us. We're all out of time today. Thank you so much for spending World Product Day with us and hearing our stories about how we've worked with customers to build some of our newest and most innovative products. We love being here with you. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.